morning. I am a board member and an alumna of Milano, the new school for management and urban policy. Milano was a terrific professional education for me. The opportunities for applied learning and engaging with top public officials that the school makes available to its students is truly distinctive. I remember well my own experiences here when I took the laboratory and issue analysis course and got to work directly with client organizations, analyzing policy options, arriving at a position, and advocating for that position were all formative parts of my professional education. Today's Milano students also engage in hands-on policy work locally and internationally from their very first semester here. Public policy forums like this morning's are another way that Milano and the Center for New York City Affairs work to improve community life in New York City and beyond. One example from about a year and a half ago was a forum featuring Deputy Mayor Dennis Walcott and several experts on collaborations between community organizations and the city's schools. The center released a report at that time called Strengthening Schools by Strengthening Families. And it ultimately spurred changes in the way the city tracks, reports, and addresses chronic absenteeism in elementary schools. The center's efforts have also advanced research on the linkages between absenteeism, academic performance, and school completion. And just last week, Mayor Bloomberg announced a new interagency task force on chronic absenteeism that stemmed directly from the center's work. And so I expect this morning's program on putting principles to the test to continue that pattern. It will be, I expect, very informative, and I am certain that the conversation afterward is likely to deliver results that will benefit New York City schools and the children and families who rely on them. As a board member and alumni of the school, I'm proud to be associated with this, and I want to congratulate Milano and the center on playing such an important role in the city's civic life. Foundations, charitable foundations, have historically played and need to continue playing an important role in strengthening our education system. The New York Community Trust, the one I work for, is one of the foundations that has labored long and hard on educational reform. We have had some successes, like our nearly 20-year commitment to the Campaign for Fiscal Equity, which worked on righting the inequity in the state school aid funding formula. But it was a very long battle, and I think it tested the patience of most private funders and even some of the most committed advocates. Now, of course, no one disputes that the landmark court decision that mandated appropriate funding for New York City's public schools was worth waiting for, or maybe they doubt it since there isn't much money to fund it. But if we were under today's mantra to measure short-term results, I suspect no private funder would have stuck with that effort. This morning's program is also something that I am very proud that the Trust is supporting, along with the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation, the United Way of New York City, the Cirrus Fund, and the Ira W. DeCamp Foundation. So please join me in giving them a round of applause. And now, with my paid commercial over, and without further ado, let me turn the program over to the center's director, Andrew White, who will get us started. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Lori. Um, we're very lucky to have you on our board and uh, playing such an active role at the school. Sincerely appreciate it. Uh, I'm Andrew White. I direct the Center for New York City Affairs. The center is an applied policy research institute based at Milano that's dedicated to improving the effectiveness of government in its work with urban families and communities. We support urban innovation through research, policy, and data analysis, public dialogue, strategic planning, and collaboration with nonprofits and government. Um, and this is one of a series of public forums we hold every semester, so I hope you're able to continue to join us in the future. I want to start by pointing out that, as I said before, the center is a part of a larger institution, Milano, the new School of Management and Urban Policy. 
where our faculty and students are deeply involved in the overlapping fields of education policy, organizational development, management, community building, and so on. And they, the, the school includes masters and PhD students who are current and future policymakers, nonprofit leaders, and community activists, and they work in legislatures and, and in the private sector as well, and they even include a few school teachers and principals. Um, and for me, one of the most fascinating things about working at Milano and teaching at Milano um, is that you begin to see the points in real life where theory and practice collide. And today, this is happening like nowhere else in the city's public school system. Our event today and the report that we've handed out to you um, and are publishing today emerge from a tremendous government experiment in what policy wonks like me call backward mapping. And a few years ago, school chancellor, school's chancellor Joel Klein set out to determine how he could best drive reform in the city's schools. He decided to do this most effectively. He would have to start at the front end, at the, at the schools themselves, where principals, teachers um, work with students and work backwards from there. He and his colleagues decided to give principals the power to control what happens in their own schools. At the same time, he gave principals incentives to achieve better and better results for their school children. Today, principals in New York have greater freedom and control than they've had in the past, but in exchange, they must get results. And the study that you'll hear about today and the discussion that follows delve deeply into this experiment, particularly into the element not only of empowerment, but of accountability and how the city measures accountability and decides whether principals and schools are performing up to the level that the city wants them to. Um, Lori already uh, mentioned our funders. <clears throat> I do want to thank them myself. I mean, she said it's a paid commercial. It's an interesting angle on a paid commercial where they give us the money and we get to have them come and speak. Uh, <laughs> but I, I very much want to thank the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation, who was the initial funder on this project, and Laurel Wolf, who's in the audience. The Ira W. DeCamp Foundation, based at J.P. Morgan Chase. The Cyrus Fund and Susan Halpern. Juanita Ayala and her team at the United Way of New York City, and once again, the New York Community Trust. I also want to acknowledge a couple of other friends who are in our audience. Martha Livingston of the Star Foundation is here. Star plays a tremendously important role here at the New School. And also Eleanor, Eleanor Sissershi, a member of the Milano Dean's Alumni Council and of our part-time faculty. Um, so, Please, let's have a round of applause for all of our friends and funders. I also want to thank the leadership of the Department of Education. This project required extensive interviews with hundreds of people connected to DOE, including Joel Klein's top deputies who shared valuable ideas and information about their work. And they candidly discuss their evolution, the evolution of this work on accountability and their efforts to constantly improve the systems and their methods. And I do think it says a lot about this administration that they're open to scrutiny and willing to listen to our feedback. As you all know, the politics of public school accountability have taken this country by storm. President Obama talks this talk a great deal and he looks to New York as a model for change. So much of this discussion revolves around questions of educational standards in New York, or educational standards. And in New York, these standards are established by the State Board of Regents. Not only broad standards of curriculum, but also the standardized tests that determine whether or not children are learning and becoming proficient in math, reading, and other subjects. Those two are the responsibility of the Board of Regents. In the current political environment, our next speaker has her work cut out for her. Meryl Tisch is chancellor of the New York State Board of Regents, a position she's held now for more than a year. She's also a longtime community leader, a philanthropist, and a board member of several critically important nonprofits in New York. And she served as a regent since 1996. For today's discussion, I think one of the most important qualifications is that she was a first grade teacher for seven years early in her career. So I'm very pleased that she could join us today. Chancellor Tisch. Good morning. Um, 
really delighted to be here. And uh, before I start my very brief remarks, I just want to take a moment to compliment Clara and Kim on what I think is a very, very outstanding report. And I'd like that to be acknowledged publicly here. It is not often that you read a report that you say, boy, they really went out of their way to be fair and balanced. The suggestions are good. The data points that they used are honorable. And I just want to acknowledge that, and I want to thank them very much. As many of you know by looking around the, the audience today, uh, I know quite a few of you from our joint work together. Uh, this is a very complicated moment in New York State, but every complicated moment brings its opportunities. And before us right now as a state and as a nation is what I think is an important opportunity in the world of educational reform. And that has to do with the challenge grant known as Race to the Top. On June 1st, New York State submitted an application in round two of the, for this challenge grant. Our request is $696 million. I believe that we have made a compelling argument to be funded in our second round. What was missing in the first round, I believe, and I think many of you here know, was critical legislation which allowed us to jump over a bar and I believe that that legislation is uh, now achieved. I believe it is embedded in the application. The legislation includes a raising of the charter cap in New York by an additional 260 charter schools. Let me take a moment to tell you that New York State has a very robust charter school environment. We have what I consider the best charter operators in the country operating in the state. The challenge for the next 260 will be, where do we attract the next generation of operators? What does the next generation of charter schools look like? How do we embed them in the public school system to kind of alleviate some of the tensions that have emerged over this first decade? But I think we are well poised in that conversation to do it. Critical also was the legislation around teacher evaluation. Up until uh, now, there has been a firewall in New York State which prohibited the use of using uh, student performance in the evaluation of teachers. I would like to take a moment to recognize our local teachers union and principals union who worked with us to produce what I think is a legislation, a legislative package around teacher evaluation that I think we can all be proud of. Starting uh, in a very few weeks, 40% of all teacher evaluation will be based on student performance. We will be providing targeted development to teachers. And the other critical piece, I believe, is that we have created a fair and expedited process by which to help teachers in the classroom who are moving out of the profession. Very, very critical. Arnie Duncan, when he was in New York uh, about two weeks ago, actually complimented the state on this legislation. I want to thank the members of the union. I want to thank the legislative body. I want to thank the governor. I want to thank everyone who worked with me uh, to make this legislation come true. We wouldn't be in a competitive position without it. But once we move past the legislation, to the subject that we want to talk, focus on this morning, I think embedded within the context of the work that we would like to do at the state level is we'd like to change the conversation away from charter schools to talk about the instructional core and what that really means for us as a state going forward. A year ago when I became chancellor, I had the privilege of leading a search to hire a new state education commissioner. I went and didn't go too far, actually. We did a nationwide search, but many of your jewels are found close to home. And we identified David Steiner, who came to us from the School of Education at Hunter, a really renowned teacher educator, a man of principle, a man of integrity. And he is leading the charge at the state education department. And he believes in the instructional core. 
And one of the first things that David said to us when he sat down at this table to be interviewed is he said, if you want me, then you have to know that I think you have it all wrong. Everyone around the table was shocked. Who tells the Board of Regents they have it all wrong? But this man didn't. He said, he made a very compelling point. He said, in New York State and probably around the country, assessments drive instruction. He said, that is the wrong way to think about education. We believe, I believe, he said, and I hope to convince you that we should develop a statewide curriculum. Additionally, we should raise the standards. Raise standards, a statewide curriculum should drive what the assessment looks like and how the assessment is used in this state. And I think that is a huge paradigm shift. Everyone talks about teaching to the test, but the problem is if the test is not requiring that the right things be taught, it becomes a useless tool. I have publicly stated over the last two, three years that I believe the statewide tests are a flawed assessment system. We, ten we, we vow to improve that. We want to change the entire conversation around the tests. We know that in New York State, 75% of the kids who graduate from high school need remedial work at CUNY. We know that when we tell a youngster that they are proficient, means they're a level three in New York State, only 52% of them at level three actually grow, go on to graduate from college. Uh, we know that there is a huge divide between, there is a fly here that is just loving me this morning. <laughs> We know um, that there is a huge divide between how students in New York perform on NAEP, that's the National Gold Standard Test, and how they do on our state assessments. We know the work cut out for us. We vow to take it on. This year, we have moved incrementally towards improving the assessment. I believe the tests have become less predictable. I believe they cover a larger part of the curriculum. And most of all, I believe that we, when we reveal the cut scores on these exams, people will really understand that we mean business. I want to um, also tell you that a year ago, I had the privilege as chancellor to sign on to the national standards movement. I believe in national standards in English language arts and math. I believe it is an important direction for this country. Commissioner Steiner has been asked to be one of the leaders in developing a national assessment, which we hope will be coming online over the next three to four years. Shale um, has joined us, Shale from the New York City Department of Education, has joined us as an integral part of our team in talking about standards and assessments ultimately in defining and redefining what we mean by accountability in New York State. The partnership between New York State and New York City is crucial to us. We cannot go forward without having New York City as our partners at the table and the other big four helping us define what it means to be a successfully educated youngster in an urban setting. Over the next six months, you're going to be hearing quite a lot from us. We are going to be redefining graduation requirements. We are going to be embedding in the future of our students the opportunity to graduate with choices. We are going to do a huge push on career and technical education. We are going to stand firm against those people who tell us that we are tracking kids we do not believe in tracking kids. We believe in providing critical choices at critical junctures. Dr. Lester Young, who sits with me on the Board of Regents, said to me, Merrill, in order not to be criticized for tracking, there's nothing wrong with tracking, he always tells me, but tracks need to lead someplace. And our graduation requirements need to have choices embedded in them. They need to lead someplace. Youngsters need to graduate with the opportunity to lead productive lives. We are going to be working 
very hard, arm in arm with all of you. But I must tell you, we need you to stand with us. We need you to be clear voices for change. These are not going to be easy conversations. Up till now, I can tell you, just based on personal experience over the last six months, there are many sacred cows when you talk about changing things. There are many things that are comfortable for people, but we need to move away from our comfort zone, and we need to do it in a robust way, but we need to do it in a way that gives everyone a voice at the table. We will not agree on everything, but I hope at the end of the day, what we will agree on is that we, our push for change is worthy of your support. I thank you for having me here this morning. I truly look forward to the panel, and um, I wish all of us much luck. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chancellor Tisch. This is very much a, a conversation that's relevant not only in New York City, not only in New York State, but nationally. Um, one of the fundamental points of this accountability system is given that the, na the federal government and others around the country are looking to us as a leader and as a model, we've got to get it right here. So that's much of what today's discussion will be about. Before we move on to the next part of this event, I want to say a few words about the center's methods. For all of our projects, we convene advisory boards that include practitioners, former public officials, scholars, parents, and others. These advisory boards play an important role. You can see a list in the back of the book. They help us think through our projects when they're initially conceived, and then they help to draft policy recommendations that we usually publish at the front of our reports, using what we've learned in our reporting, as well as their expertise. That said, our advisory board members do not have an editorial role in our research and reporting outside of the policy recommendations. And this matters only because it's important that the sole responsibility for the reporting and content of the project lies with the authors and with myself as the editor. So don't blame them. Um, earlier, I thanked the leadership of the Department of Education. I also want to mention the, the tremendous number of people who gave time to us, gave of their time for us to interview them as we w went through this. That included many principals, teachers, students, guidance counselors, parents, um, and others. Literally hundreds of interviews over the course of a year. The key authors of the report, you can see right there, Clara Hemphill and Kim Nauer. They were assisted by Helen Zilan and Sharon McCloskey. But I also want to mention a small army of graduate students who did essential work on the project, including Tom Jacobs, Rajiv Yernani, and Ali Ramondi, who are here today, I think. Um, this entire project culminated in a last round of editing and proofreading, even as Kim was giving birth to her beautiful daughter, Anna, a week ago. So a week and a half ago, I should say. So I'm afraid that little girl's going to have school accountability deeply implanted in her subconscious for, <laughs> for some time to come. Um, another wonk in the making. Um, let's move on to a short overview of the report presented by Clara Hemphill. After that, Clara will invite Chancellor Tisch and the panel up to the front of the stage and moderate a discussion. You each have a note card. I hope that you were handed as you came in um, at the door. Those are for your questions. Please write any questions you have on that card, hold it up over your head, and, and one of the crew will come around and pick it up. Um, and we'll try and get through as many of those later in the morning as we can. We'll have a couple of people circulating on the aisles throughout the whole discussion to grab those. I'm very pleased to introduce Clara Hemphill, senior editor at the Center for New York City Affairs and lead author of the report. Many of you will also know her as the founder of Inside Schools and in a previous decade as a reporter at Newsday. Clara. Thank you, Andrew. There, there's been a huge debate over education um, in New York City in the past eight years. And for this report, we wanted to look at the ever-changing organization of the New York City public schools to see if those reforms uh, are making a difference. Um, 
the eyes of the nation are on New York City, as, uh, as Andrew said, and the Obama administration has invested heavily in the notion of using data accountability and school choice to turn around urban schools. New York City is in the forefront and of this movement, and Bloomberg says our system of accountability is the most developed and the most extensive in the nation. Could I have slide two, please? One of the things that we want to point out is that there have been significant, um, and in some cases really measurable, improvements in the many schools. Um, if you, I want you to look at this chart. On, we have the state tests on the top line and the federal uh, NAEP tests on the bottom two lines. One of the, um, as you can see, there has been steady improvement on both of these. These top lines are somewhat controversial. What the, um, some people say that these gains don't represent real gains, that the tests have gotten progressively easier over time. Um, I think it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. The tests cover, the state English and reading tests cover only a small portion of what the state says children should learn. So for example, the state learning standards for English language say children should learn to use a library, select appropriate books, speak clearly, express opinions, write and revise their work using multiple sources of information. As those of you who teach or have children in the public schools know, the tests in fact just ask you to read a short paragraph and uh, answer some multiple choice questions. It's not that there's, it's not that the tests are bad, it's just that the tests are very, very limited. And the more emphasis you put on them, the more teachers are naturally going to emphasize the things that are tested and ignore all of the other standards. So that um, what the state says kids should be doing is learning things like how to deliver a campaign speech, how to write a letter to the editor, how to recite a favorite poem, how to perform a dramatic reading. These are skills which are going to help our kids um, succeed in high school and college, but none of them are measured by the state tests. So that one of the fears is that the more you emphasize these tests, um, the more you're going to get what they call grade inflation that may or may not reflect actual learning. Daniel Koretz, who's um, uh, a testing expert at Harvard, says that the more you make these tests high stakes, the more you'll get grade inflation, which is variable, unpredictable, and doesn't necessarily reflect real learning. That said, I think there really are some uh, dramatic gains in the New York City public schools over the past eight years. The NAEP tests, which are the federal ones, which are not high stakes, um, the, the kids, a small sample of New York City kids take them. Those have also, if you look at the very bottom line for math, fourth grade math, you'll see that there has been an increase. Now, parents in the Bronx are not going to jump up and down and cheer because it's gone from 20% uh, re meeting standards to 35% meeting standards. But the fact is that does represent, in, our, in my opinion, real progress. You'll find similar gains in the fourth grade math. We have not seen similar gains in, on the eighth grade yet. Um, I honestly think that it's logical that, that you'd see the gains in the lower grades before you see them in the higher grades. Um, there's the other evidence that we have that there's um, real gains in the New York City public schools comes from our street reporting, our visiting the schools. I visited the schools, I visited 30 schools in District 7, which is in the South Bronx, at the beginning of the Klein administration in 2003 and 2004. And in those days I saw a lot of instruction in Spanish with kids reading, uh, learning English just for an hour a day. A lot of the teachers I saw make grammatical mistakes in both English and Spanish. Um, there were very few books and supplies. In the middle schools, the children were um, uh, often rowdy. You'd see hordes of kids roaming the halls. The teachers would be teaching to half-empty classrooms. Um, I went back this fall and this winter to many of those same schools, and I saw really dramatic improvements. 
There's still really big problems, don't get me wrong. Not all of the schools are perfect yet. But in the schools, the dozen or so schools that I visited, I saw much more instruction in English. The um, uh, bilingualism has uh, declined. It's now used more as a transition while children are learning English rather than five or six years of Spanish-only instruction as it had been before. Um, in the middle schools, I saw lots of kids actually in classrooms with their teachers actually teaching with no roaming in the halls. I saw kids engaged in lively uh, discussions. We have one of the principals of the, of the schools that I like a lot here today to be on the panel. So I think there are real gains that there have been over the past eight years. At the same time, there's lots of reasons why people don't trust the test scores uh, as demonstrated by the top line on that. Could I have the next slide, please? A big part of our research was trying to make sense of the fantastically complicated uh, organization and reorganization of the city schools over the past eight years uh, since Bloomberg took control of the city schools. Um, this map shows you the system which uh, Chancellor Klein inherited that had been in place since 1969. There were 32 districts which operated the um, elementary and middle schools. The high schools were still, were, were always run by central. In these districts, there were some excellent, excellent districts, but there were also some bad ones, and honestly, the bad ones were really, really bad. Um, if I could see the next map, please. This was the first organization that Chancellor Klein did in 2003, shortly after, about six months after he came into power. What he did was he combined the 32 districts into 10 regions. And what he tried to do was combine the weak districts with the strong districts. So for example, District 2 on the Upper East Side became Region 9, and it was combined with District 7 in the South Bronx uh, and what happened was you began to get some cross-fertilization between District 7 in the South Bronx and the Upper East Side. Uh, Ramon Gonzalez, who was a principal in District 7, both benefited from this regional structure because he began to get, uh, have contact with colleagues from the Upper East Side. He also contributed to it because one of the things he had learned was classroom management, how to deal with behavior problems, how to deal with special education, which were issues that he dealt with in the South Bronx successfully and that the Upper East Side also had to learn from him. Some people called this structure districts on steroids. There were some complaints that there was micromanagement, that uh, uh, principals were being told uh, everything from where to put a rocking chair in the corner to having their kids sit on a rug to how the bulletin boards were um, uh, organized. Um, but I saw that there was a lot of um, improvements in a lot of the districts. Um, if I could look at the next slide, please. Um, however, the chancellor, although there were improvements, the chancellor was impatient for change. And um, in 2007, he set up yet another structure, which as you can see, was not set by geography at all. What he did, this was based on an experiment started by Eric Nadelstern, who had been an alternative high school principal in Queens at uh, Queens International High School. And what Eric had been experimenting with was something called an autonomy zone, where principals were freed from the supervision of a superintendent in exchange for signing a contract that they would uh, uh, meet certain standards in terms of achievement on standardized tests and graduation rates. What Chancellor Klein decided to do in 2007 was expand the autonomy zone, essentially, for every school in the city. Um, and you can see a little bit better in the colors in your book. Um, but what this meant is that schools no longer had any geographical uh, connection and that they were no longer supervised by a uh, superintendent. If I could look at the next slide, please. Um, a further change started in January this year and is, is uh, going on as we speak now. Um, the chancellor dismantled what he'd called the school support organizations, which is what the um, principals had chosen 
rather than being assigned to a district, they chose to be in a particular organization, partly as a result of uh, funding issues um, and partly as a way of getting more uniform control over the schools. The chancellor dismantled these school support organizations and set up what he called children's first networks. The children's first networks really combined some of the services which had been available previously in the districts. That is, instead of just having instructional support, these mini districts now had support for legal help and um, labor negotiations and um, transportation and food services. These services were now provided by the Children's First Network. However, they're still not geographically determined. Um, what we found, what is, the, um, what is the purpose of this? Are these working? What happens was the, the, the network leaders are not a boss. They're not a boss the way the superintendent is. Instead, they're like a coach. And a lot of the report focuses on how well the system of empowerment works. We found that a lot of the principals felt liberated. They felt free from the oppressive hand of the district superintendents. But we also found that some of the principals were not ready for this freedom and that they really need more supervision than they were getting. The other thing we found is that some of the principals felt isolated from others just a few blocks away. The reshuffling of the networks is going on right now. The offices that are offer budget, payroll, and legal help are now integrated into the offices that have instructional support. Um, but some of the networks will have schools in four boroughs. It's a very complicated structure. I think it's hard even for the people who are in it to understand it. Um, <laughs> I got to laugh, huh? <laughs> um, um, and we can discuss more whether it's working or not. Slide seven, I want to show you the balance of power. This one you might want to look at in your book. It's on charge, uh, page 15. We tried to figure out the chain of command in the new system. Yeah, another laugh, okay. Um, you'll see the school boards are gone entirely. The school boards uh, used to run the 32 districts. They were eliminated by the state legislature in 2002. However, the state legislature left in place the districts and the superintendents. Um, However, the chancellor has interpreted the law absolutely as narrowly as possible. And you'll see the superintendents here on the left are in a very, very tiny box. This chart shows a little bit how accountability works. Um, instead of having a superintendent who comes into your school maybe once a week and gives you advice about how to uh, uh, improve things, you have people in the accountability office at Tweed monitoring your progress according to the numbers. Uh, and the system of monitoring is the four boxes um, on top of the principal. As you can see, the principal has a much larger role um, and the superintendents have been diminished um, to a really tiny role. They are not even permitted in the schools without the permission of the principal. They have to call ahead and make an appointment. And if the principal doesn't want them, they don't have to, uh, they, they don't have to let them in. Parents, um, needless to say, have a hard time figuring out uh, who to call in this system. Um, and we'll have a parent leader on the panel afterwards. One mother in the Bronx told me that you can call the superintendent, but he or she can't really do anything if you have a problem. Another mother told me that her school kept losing the paperwork for her request for special ed services. She said she was going to call the school board to complain, and then she remembered there aren't any more school boards. So she said she would write the mayor or the chancellor. She voted for the mayor and she thought that would be a good way to, to deal with things. In fact, 
that's what a lot of parents do. They, they email directly to the chancellor, um, and um, it, it's a lot of responsibility for um, uh, somebody in charge of 1.1 uh, million children. One thing to note is that the networks, which are the voluntary associations of uh, schools, are becoming more and more uh, powerful. They were set up as coaches, that is, the principals were meant to choose the networks. Um, but now they're striking a, a more of a balance between supervision and support. Could I look at slide eight? This is complicated. Can you see why it took us a year to figure this out? Um, this is also complicated, but it's a really important part of the report. In 2007, Klein set up an A to F grading system for schools. He wanted to have a simple way of parents understanding whether their school was doing what it should do. Um, this was based mostly on gains on test scores. And decisions about whether principals get a bonus or removed from their jobs depend heavily on the grades on these progress reports. But we found that some really nice schools with engaging classes and kids making lots of progress scored very low on their progress reports. And we saw some not so exciting schools where the kids had heads on their desks and the teachers were reading newspapers that got some great grades. The DOE is trying to be fair to schools that do a good job with kids who are struggling. So it's trying to measure the gains that the schools make, not just the overall level of achievement. And it's also trying to compare similar schools to each other. We think this is important to try to measure the gains and we think it's important to recognize that some schools um, have much more challenging populations than others. But we also found that the system is very much a work in progress and you can get some surprisingly good grades for schools that are not so great and some surprisingly bad grades for schools um, um, that, that we think are really making great progress. So what this chart is trying to show is the black line on the gray in the middle shows two schools that I visited in the South Bronx. You'll see PS 277, which is a school that I think is making fantastic progress. It went, you'll see in three years, the kids went from uh, just above 40% of the kids reading at grade level to uh, above 60% of the kids reading at grade level. Um, it's a very high poverty school, a lot of kids learning English, a lot of kids with special education needs. I think that was like, we walk into the school, there's really engaging curriculum, really engaging teachers. I thought they're making really terrific progress. But on the Department of Ed's progress reports, they put them in the very bottom, which is what the rankings are, the green line on the bottom, shows you how the Department of Ed ranks this school on their progress report. It is um, in the something, I can't read the number, but it's something like the 20th percentile on the progress report. There's another school about a half a mile away, which is PS 161. Oh, I'm sorry, PS 277. They care a lot about um, um, science, history. They have the children do a lot of research projects. There's a lot of speaking in class. But none of those things are measured by the state tests. What are measured by the state tests are, can you read this paragraph and can you answer um, uh, uh, multiple choice questions? I'm not saying those aren't important skills. I'm just saying there's a lot of other skills which are missing. On the left, on the other hand, you'll see PS 161. Um, this is also a, a school that's very high poverty. This is also a school with a lot of kids reading, um, a, a lot of kids learning English, and a really huge special ed population. About 30% of the kids are um, special ed uh, uh, eligible. This school you'll see has not made huge amounts of progress in the last couple of years as measured by the state tests, but it's kind of a steady eddy school. Um, when you walk in, you'll see a lot of kids with heads on desks. You'll see teachers reading the papers. Um, you'll, you'll have almost no class discussion. Very few um, uh, examples of children work on the uh, board. 
Uh, the principal acknowledges that he does a lot of test prep with the children, a lot of narrowly focused. He's a sweet guy. I like him. And he has music and art for the kids. But he's very, very focused on the uh, getting good results on the specialized test. Um, this school is ranked in the very top of the citywide progress reports. It's um, uh, in some, some years it was in the 94th percentile, some it was in the 80th. I was trying to understand why a school that I thought was really doing a great job and was making progress was in the bottom fifth, and while a school which was just kind of steady eddy was considered in the, in the top rank. And I delved deeply into the way they crunch the numbers for this. Um, Shale may want to go on to it further. The quick answer is that the, um, the tests are not measuring the broader curriculum that I found so engaging when I visited the school 277. And PS 161 is getting a lot of credit for the fact that they have huge numbers of special needs kids. Um, 277 has a lot of homeless kids. It has about 20% special needs kids, but it's not considered as needy. Um, one of the things that the principal at 277 tells me is that she tries very hard not to refer children to special ed. She prefers to teach them in the mainstream class. A lot of pedagogues would, would, would agree with that approach, but it, it penalizes her on the progress reports. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is another um, slide that shows you um, what some of the problems are with using the state tests to measure growth rather than whether the kids are at grade level. This shows whether the kids are at grade level. As you can see, um, each bar represents a different elementary school in District 7 in the South Bronx. You can see there's pretty good steady rise on these test scores um, over, um, over the time that uh, Klein has been in office. If we can look at the next score, please. What happens, though, when the, um, this is what happens when you plot each of the school's rankings on the progress report. You see they go up and down seemingly at random with no pattern. When you look at the percentile rankings, you see just a tremendous amount of volatility and no steady trends uh, one way or the other. The rankings just don't look like they mean anything here. What's going on here? It's not that there's anything wrong with the tests, but they're only a rough guide to whether a kid can read a passage or do a math problem. They aren't precise enough to be used to measure year-to-year -year progress and to compare schools to, another, another, uh, to one another. And that's the way the city's using this. When you get swings like this, it's hard to say whether they reflect real changes or random error. The city's putting more weight on the tests than they were designed to bear. And we think they shouldn't be used to decide important things, like whether to close a school or give a principal a $25,000 bonus based on these um, numbers going up and down. Uh. Okay, next slide. This is a high school progress report. This is for the highest ranking school in the city in 2009. It got uh, not only an A, as you can see, but it got 105, that is more than 100%. Um, on its um, uh, ranking. Um, it's probably not one you've heard of. It's the High School of Hospitality Management um, in the Park West building in the Bronx. Um, if you, I'm sorry, did I say the Bronx, Manhattan? Uh, west side of Manhattan. High School of Hospitality Management in the Park West building in, on the west side of Manhattan. Um, the progress report is made up of four subscores. I don't know. This is like a, an eye chart. Can you see the letters, or is it? Um, it's in your it's in your book if you if you can't see it. Um, the school environment on this um, highest ranking school in the city got um, a D. Uh, the D uh, is based on the attendance, which was very poor at this school. And it was based on surveys of parents, 
teachers and kids. Um, there's some, uh, we don't know how accurate that survey is. I mean, we know that we don't know how many of the parents and kids and teachers actually responded, but we do know that of the people that responded, the, they said they were, the school has low expectations, poor levels of communication, low levels of student engagement, poor safety record, and poor attendance. Um, so why did this school get uh, the highest rank. Now, I, actually, I'm not in the business of trashing schools, um, and, and I don't even want to trash this school. W what the progress reports are looking at is progress. And I think the Department of Ed is doing a very good job of trying to recognize the gains that are made by schools that deal with really, really tough populations. So that if you look at a school like, you know, Bronx Science or Stuyvesant, they get smart kids in, they get smart kids out. We don't really know how much value they're adding. This school, in fact, is adding a huge amount of value. Um, what happens is that they have, they're getting some kids who are scoring very, very low on their eighth grade tests. They're coming in at, uh, most of them are coming in at a low level two. And somehow, they are passing their classes, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, and graduating these kids on time. The other thing that the Department of Ed is trying to do is to give um, a boost to schools that do a good job with special education kids and kids who are learning English. And this school does an exceptionally good job of that. So I don't know, I think there's, it, 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 how do you grade a school like this? Do you say it's the best school in the city? Or do you trash it because it has low attendance rates? I don't know, it seems to me one of the things you could do is say it does a really good job with kids who are um, very challenging, but it has a lot of issues. Our feeling is that you shouldn't try to sum up complicated schools with one letter grade. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Um, this is um, essentially, this is the Department of Ed's response to the criticisms that, of the report cards that I've just given you in the past um, um, 20 minutes. The, um, what are the tests good for? We say that the tests aren't that precise, that there isn't really a difference between 2.1 and 2.2 on the state tests. Because of the way the state tests are set up, um, most of the questions are clustered around a high level two and a low level three. Because what the state wants to know is, are you level three? They don't really care about level four and level one. So as a result, they only have a few questions geared for level one or level four. What that means is that it could be just a lucky guess that puts you into, luck, into um, level four, or really bad luck that puts you into level one. And this is the result, this is the reason that you see these wild year-to-year -year fluctuations. The tests were designed to, to measure proficiency, they weren't designed to measure progress. But what the Department of Ed will say is, yes, in fact, there is a difference between 2.1 and 2.2, 2.2 and 2.3. And what they did is they plotted. And they took the kids in 2003 or 2002, they took their eighth grade uh, reading scores, I can't remember if this is reading or math, maybe a combined number, and they plotted them four years later in 2007 to see how many of the entering eighth graders actually graduated on time with a Regents Diploma or better. Um, and you will see this, unlike the other charts I showed you, is actually a very smooth chart. That, um, that suggests that, in fact, the tests, whatever else you may say about them, are predictive of uh, graduation. 
I just want to make one point here, um, and Shale will I'll give you time to rebut this. Um, I wonder whether the fact that these tests were done in 2003 has some effect on the smoothness of this chart. That was before we had high stakes accountability measures. That was before we put huge amount of emphasis on the tests. And as Daniel Koretz at Harvard says, there, um, uh, the more emphasis you put on these tests, the more you make them high stakes, the greater the grade inflation, but grade inflation is unpredictable and can have different effects on different places. Um, so I'm going to, that's my, I'll leave you with one more slide, which is our recommendations. Um, these are also in the book, if the print's too small for you. Statistics have their place. Um, we think tests are useful. But the cities put more weight on the tests, the uh, standardized tests, than they were designed to bear. We think the schools are, in fact, getting better. But the current, measure of measuring, the current method of measuring the progress undermines the credibility of the department's assertion that the tests are improving. All we want to say is that the city must recognize the limitation of the progress report and rely more on qualitative measures, human judgment, and less on statistics. Thank you very much. So I'm going to call up the panelists now. We have um, from um, my left to right, your, um, your right to left, we have John Garvey, who um, uh, was for many years uh, the liaison between the public schools and the City University of New York. He's written a really excellent report on college readiness um, and some of the problems that he's encountered there. He's also the proud father of uh, at least one public school teacher. Um, um, Jackie Wayans and I go way back. Um, uh, she has three children in the public schools. Uh, she uh, lives in the Bronx. She and I work together on um, uh, the books, the best New York City public elementary, middle, and high schools. She was also an ace reporter for the InsideSchools.org uh, website. And her, um, she's now a member of the Community Education Council for District 10, which is the parent advisory group which has replaced the school boards. Um, next we have uh, Shale Palakow Sharansky, sorry, um, he um, is head of accountability for the Department of Education and I think is a really good sport to uh, come today on. <laughs> um, he is um, uh, was a teacher and was also the founding principal of uh, Bronx International High School. So he, is that right, Bronx International? Yeah. Um, so he has uh, been in the trenches. Um, he's not a distant bureaucrat who has never been in a classroom. He really knows what it means to teach some very um, challenging kids. Next we have uh, Ramon Gonzalez who was, um, it is now principal of one of my favorite middle schools in the Bronx, uh, MS223. When he first went into that building, I think they had 600 broken windows, right, uh, Ramon? Um, and it's now a really excellent school that has lots of visitors from across the city to see how well they teach writing um, and, and uh, reading. Um, and then Merrill Tisch has already been introduced. So thank you, panelists, for coming. Um, I guess I want to start. Should I start with Shale? Is that? Sure. Yeah. So um, Shale, um, what is your um, what is your reaction to my slideshow? <laughs> well, first of all, let me thank you for the effort to really look closely at what we've been doing because I think that um, there have been. Is that better? Yeah. Let me thank you for the effort to really look closely at what we've been doing because I think it is complicated and there's a lot of moving pieces and um, it merits public discussion and debate and dialogue. So thank you for that. Um, I want to first sort of pull back for a second from the details and then respond a bit on, on some of the details that you raised. The intention behind 
the intention behind the public school accountability system is to create an opportunity to really measure whether schools are adding value. Um, we've had in the city many, many years of neglect in our school system. You described some of the results of that prior to this administration. And there's been a really careful, thoughtful effort over the past six or seven years to think about what does it take um, to create a public school system that actually meets the standards of quality that we would want for every kid in our city. And I really believe that we've made powerful progress on that. And I think part of the reason we've made that progress is some of the systemic reforms that we've put into place. And so the, the empowerment and accountability are powerfully linked together. Um, the notion that you can regulate schools to success, which has been sort of how many failing urban districts have been run for decades around the country, just doesn't work. Um, we saw in New York City, and I actually brought a couple slides of my own just to, to give people a sense of some of this data. So if you could just give us the, the second slide in the deck. Um, the, in New York City, we had flat graduation rates for decades. Um, it usually hovered either just above or just below um, the 50% line. And under this administration, one of the things that was recognized is that systems actually produce exactly the kinds of results that they're designed to produce. And so we had a school system that was pretty well designed to get us a 50% graduation rate for a long time. And that's not acceptable. And so we've really been looking at ways to change that equation and to really think about what's it going to take um, to get to the point where we are at a 90 or 100 percent graduation rate. And we've started, as you can see, um, the, the chart above shows the rate of incline over the last seven years. We've moved from approximately 50 to approximately 60 on the state measures. If you look at August graduation, which is all the kids who graduate, which the state has just started to measure, we're at 62.7. Um, that's a powerful shift. And we're by no means done with that. But part of the reason that we're able to make this shift is really rethinking our assumptions about how schools are held accountable and how schools are supervised and supported. And so as we look at where the strengths and weaknesses are in the system, I think it's also really important to recognize that for the first time in New York City under this administration, we're actually seeing the kinds of results and the kinds of growth that we want to see. Um, so now let's kind of dig in a little bit to some of the details. Um, if, if you could actually just flip back to the slide in Clara's report that showed the sort of wild swings um, in the percentile rankings that, that she was talking about, I think that's one of, one of the concerns I have is that as you look at data, that we really are as precise as possible about what are the causes and, and understanding those causes is what allows us to fix some of the problems. So first of all, the progress report percentile ranks came in in 2007. This chart actually doesn't refer to anything about the progress report percentile ranks. This is a chart that looks at 2000 through 2010 and it attempts to rank um, New York City schools in relation to each other on their absolute performance. Um, so it's not, it's not anything about the progress reports or the ranks that we're assigning. It's something that this team created to try and um, quantify the changes in performance at an absolute level. One of the things about the progress report is it's not just measuring absolute performance. It's actually attempting to measure growth. And the reason why we're doing that, and it's interesting and difficult to do this, is that if you just measure absolute performance, then your results are going to map pretty closely to your zip code or to the entrance requirements to your school. And so for years and years and years in this city and elsewhere in the country, when you looked at absolute performance, you got very expected results. And what we believe is that schools do make a difference with kids and that they can really give them the skills they need to succeed. And it's important to try and figure out ways to measure that. Um, as folks mentioned earlier, um, that's now become part of the federal national agenda to measure growth. Um, the state is also working on developing a measure for growth. 
And New York was one of the first places to say, it really does matter whether kids are growing, not just whether they met an absolute standard. And so one of the big goals behind the progress report is to measure that growth. Now, it's hard to do. And Clara points out one of the things that's challenging. Um, the existing state exams do focus most of their questions closer to the, the mean around that three. But if you could just flip back to the, the step chart that um, Clara ended on, um, I just want to make that point a little bit more explicit. The reason why growth is important is that if you move from a 3 to a 3.5 on this chart, um, your graduation outcome goes from um, something in the order of 50, 55 percent right up into the 80s. And so that kind of growth has a very powerful impact on kids' actual life chances. And the opportunity for schools to push kids from a level 3 to a level 3.5, which may sound very boring and technical, can mean the difference between those kids getting a high school diploma or not. And that's an important thing to try and support and to measure. And part of the reason we're seeing the gains um, in schools like District 7, that, that we're studying in District 7, is because we're actually asking people to be accountable. Um, just one more slide I wanted to share. Um, the, the fourth slide in, in, the, in my deck um, shows all of the districts, the 64 largest districts in New York State. Um, and you'll see on here that um, District 7 has seen the highest growth almost in the state. They're number five of all the districts in the state. Um, we really believe that the reforms that we've implemented have been a driver and an engine for that growth. And we think that measuring growth is a really powerful way to, to, to help incentivize that. Now, it's not perfect. There's definitely places where there are flaws. And one of the things that I've been working hard on since I took on this position is really trying to understand where can we strengthen this. And I've spent a lot of time talking with educators and others around the city. Um, in January, we announced a couple really important changes to how we're doing the progress reports. And this is also mentioned towards the end of Clara's report. Um, the way we measure growth was too sensitive and we feel that there's a more precise way to measure it, and that's being implemented um, in this year's progress reports. And essentially the difference, and it, it gets a little bit complicated, but the basic difference is we're trying to control for where kids start. Um, in past measures, we basically said, how much did you go up? And we measured that growth. But what we found is that depending on where you started, your ability to go up varied. And it was easier to make progress at the lower ends of the spectrum than the higher ends of the spectrum. And so we actually really want to be as precise as possible, and we do want the reports to make sense in an intuitive way. And I think that it's actually that factor, getting more precise about measuring the growth, that will address some of the concerns that are raised in the report around volatility. And it's something that has been raised, honestly, by academics and other folks within the system over the past couple of years. And we've been working hard and found a model in Colorado to address this um, that's now actually being considered also by New York State and by 37 other states nationally as a model for measuring growth because it's been so effective. I, I think um, we can all agree that we want to measure growth and how far kids are moving and how much value added, if you will, and not just where they started. I mean, where, you know, where they end up, but how, um, I want to ask Meryl Tisch, um, if we all care about measuring growth, why do we have state tests that are not designed to measure this? I, I think that, that is a really fair question. I, I want to... I, I don't think your mic's working. Oh. No, it's okay? Okay. Really close. Can you hear me? I have, a, I have a teacher's voice. Can you hear me? Yeah. I want to say that uh, a couple of things. I, I, I want to... Are they going to make you talk? Are they going to make you talk? Okay. She'll get too much feedback. So, can you hear? Am I okay? So, it, it's very significant for us to really, as long as Shale is here and I am here, to 
really have everyone understand that we acknowledge the problem of the state assessment and how it's being used. So I want to make two or three points. The first point I want to make is this is really a state-driven issue. We set the bar in terms of proficiency at a very low rate. The city cleverly ran a truck through the low standards that we put up there. It's going to be a very big shock to the system when Dan Koritz, who you keep referring to, comes back to us over the next 10 days to help the state set new tests new test scores in terms of cut scores, as well as in terms of defining proficiency. I believe that additionally, when the state looks at defining graduation requirements, we're going to look at a region's diploma that aligns with college ready. So we're going to be telling the truth about the graduates that we are declaring as graduates, whether or not in fact they are meeting a bar that allows them to be college ready, and I would probably say, therefore, many urban centers around this state over the next two, three months are going to be looking at th kids who used to be threes, definitely being twos, graduation standards where we used to say they're graduating, bas basically on local diplomas, which was a very low bar. These issues are going to be addressed. The graduation rates are going to, but, I but, think, take a hit. And now I want to talk about what we're going to do with the test, because I think a lot of you have been reading about the hit that we've been taking at the State Education Department over the last few weeks in terms of constructed items, constructed response items on tests. We are terribly, terribly frustrated by, by tests that ask kids to come in, fill in a bubble, yes, no, maybe, walk away getting 16 out of 45 and us saying, ah, oh, that kid is proficient. We are going to be working really aggressively to try to expand the number of constructed items on tests. We are going to be working aggressively on trying to expand what we view as a test that can be used in a nuanced way to define growth and to give parents and communities a better snapshot of what's actually going on in classrooms around this state. We understand and I think we have been very forthright that we did not believe that assigning a letter grade based on these tests or using them for promotional decisions was what we would consider great public policy. These are the tests that were put in place. They have some significance, even a lousy test I think gives you some valuable information about what youngsters are doing and learning, but we fully acknowledge that the next generation of tests and the next generation of how teachers and schools are assessed as a whole needs to have a broader, much more nuanced, much more constructivist approach to really giving a, a full picture. I want to shift the conversation now to um, empowerment and the networks. That was, um, you know. Could I just make one point on the test before you? Yeah, do? okay. Um, I, I think it's important for people to realize what powerful leadership Merrill is taking around this issue because for years and years and years in New York State, there wasn't leadership on this issue. And, and Merrill and, and David have really stepped forward and been really honest about where there's still work to be done and have taken a leadership not just in the state, but nationally in terms of trying to look at what's it gonna take to build a next generation of assessment. And there's really, I mean, this is a story that's just beginning, but there's really very exciting work happening nationally with um, 48 states that have signed on to the Common Core Standards and are now in the process of working to develop proposals on a next generation of assessments. And what you'll see in those assessments is lots more writing to start with. And we should note, New York State tests are better than a lot of states, and they're not by any means all multiple choice. There is real writing in the existing tests, but there's gonna be a lot more writing and a lot more opportunities for kids to use critical thinking and problem solving. And ideally, we're looking to create a system of assessments that you really would get that range that you're talking about. 
That doesn't mean, though, that you make perfect enemy of the good. It doesn't mean that you do nothing and you wait until all of that is perfect before you start to push on the question of, our kids learn. I want to shift now to empowerment and the notion that uh, principals don't report to a superintendent. Um, they make decisions on budget and um, hiring and curriculum on their own. Um, Ramon, does empowerment work? How you think it's a good thing? I just want to make uh, two. Just want to say two things first. First thing is really awkward seeing your colleagues' life work on a, on a slide on the screen. Mm -hmm. Both 161 and 277 are both hardworking principals. Yes. I know their work. Yeah. And for those who don't know them, I suggest you go visit the schools and see the schools yourself. Because uh, we all know that the best way to find out about a school is actually walking to school and not just looking at this data. Points. So, can I say that? <laughs> thing is, um, I get asked a question that I attend the Leadership Academy. I did not. So any issues you have with that, please move that away from me. Okay. So what's your question? <laughs> um, does empowerment work? Um, uh, first of all, I think as principals, we have always been empowered. Um, and it came with being well trained. Um, I was fortunate that um, I was uh, a teacher, staff developer, assistant principal, then a principal. So I learned on an apprenticeship model. Um, and it's something that seems to be missing today. In terms of... In, in, uh, in terms of actual empowerment, I have a great network. Um, I love empowerment. Um, I'm also fortunate that um, I've been doing this for a little while. I'm in my seventh year as a principal. Um, so I have different needs, I think, than a first year, second year principal. Um, is it perfect? No. You know, nothing is perfect. And as we reflect on it, we will get better. Um, I think uh, from where my school is, um, it gives me a lot of opportunities. I mean, case in point, the other day we realized that, um, more like a couple months ago, we realized that um, our high school choices of our students weren't as great as we thought they were. Um, and given that I have a little more say on our curriculum, we decided to change one of our units to do a high school unit. Because if any of you have ever been through the high school process, you know how crazy it is. Um, and so that's, um, and that comes through empowerment. That comes with the ability, so we integrate our literacy. That became the theme of the unit across the school. And so my kids can tell you what high school they're interested in. We also had a high school fair that came to the school. Again, my kids learned about presentation skills. This all went around um, into the curriculum. Um, in terms of uh, uh, hiring choices at my school, um, when empowerment came, a lot of flexibility that normally didn't exist before. Um, I joke with people, but as a sad part of it is that our school is like a refugee center. Um, teachers come from really bad experiences to our school to interview. And I hear these stories every single day. Um, and uh, it's something that um, um, I have the ability to hire different people with different backgrounds. And, I, and frankly, I get great data from the DOE to do that hiring. Um, I still think you gotta still do the grunt work and call the schools and find out about them. And that's not gonna take away. If you're a principal that likes to hang out in your office, this is not a good system for you. Um, you need to get out into those classrooms, and that was the understanding. That's the contract I signed. Um, I'm a person who believes in social justice, and I think it's, um, is it Rodenham and Willingham who we'll talk about better assessment, better curriculum, and better teaching, and pedagogy is the last to change. So if you're not in those classrooms, you're not gonna see the change you wanna see. And um, under empowerment, under Salah Balaban, who's our leader, and uh, who's leaving, um, but who um, has done an incredible job of um, getting us access to other schools. I joined a, a Manhattan Network. I'm a Bronx uh, principal and I joined the Manhattan Network because I wanted to get access to the Manhattan High Schools. Mm -hmm. I felt that um, a lot of our kids in the Bronx, we didn't have a lot of options in the Bronx um, for our kids. And I want them to have access to some of the elite Manhattan schools. And the network I'm in tends to be more the elite Manhattan um, middle schools and high schools. And that partnership, and she does an incredible job of getting us to um, 
um, talk about issues. And, and, and frankly, there was a point um, where I was actually thinking of leaving the network. And I looked around, and there was no other better network than the network I was in. Um, and I said, you know what, I have to kind of eat what my issues are and, and deal with the folks in my network because you know the, the power of that um, of the organization is fantastic. With that said, there are some issues. Um, I'm really concerned with the, what's happening with the ISC. Um, it's almost like the ISC is the um, administrative offices that were used for operations for things uh, like uh, labor support, right, um, right. Uh, uh, I mean, budgeting, and the the ISC was fantastic for us. I mean, it also gave me a place. and they're and they're being closed as right. of July first. So yeah, gave me a, so this is where we talk about accountability. My biggest issue is I think principals are, are the most accountable in this system. I don't know if everyone else is. Um, and that's that's an issue, right? So um, you want to listen to talk? Because I'm yeah, I, I, like, look, I'm going to ask John Garvey now. Um, Ramon gave us the um, principal's eyes view. John has a, a broad view. Um, do you think the networks function as they were designed to? Well, um, a couple of, can I, like everyone else, a couple of things? Yeah. <laughs> First, it is a really good report, and I urge you to read it. Second, I think actually that kind of the seven years since Joel Klein became chancellor has, has recorded extraordinary accomplishments, okay? If you look at those, the rates of graduation going up, okay, you're talking about tens of thousands of kids who graduated, okay, previously would probably not have, okay? And that's something really cannot be forgotten. What I'm not sure about, okay, and this leads to the answer to your question, is if we really fully understand why and how we got that improvement in graduation rates. And I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical of the argument of the contribution that, that autonomy and empowerment made to that in, in, increase in graduation rates and increase in school effectiveness more broadly. I think, in fact, looking back, okay, that, that the, the, the 10 regional structure was never really given quite enough time to be tested out for what, what, what its long-term effectiveness might have been. I think that the initial decision made to move towards autonomy and then to empowerment was kind of, in some ways, a kind of a very forceful decision and was made for some very good reasons, some of which Shale has described. I'm not sure that the evidence base for it, okay, was in fact fully established, nor is there much of a, of a kind of an evidence base for all of the changes that have been made since the introduction of first of autonomy, then of empowerment, and then now Children's First Networks. On the other hand, okay, no one should be in favor of going back to the superintendencies, okay? Those are really pretty vile affairs, okay? There were some good ones and whatever, okay? But no one should be in favor of that, and I'm not in favor of it. What I think that kind of, that needs to be explored is kind of in some ways more fully realizing the power of networks, okay? I'm, I'm really quite convinced that the, one of the most important ways in which we can improve educational achievement is by forming networks of professional practice, okay? But the thing that the networks are not largely the networks of the principals, they need to be the networks of the teachers in schools and across schools. And part of that is that kind of, that networks have to be informed or larger organizations by a pedagogical sensibility. How are we actually going? What is our strategy for improving practice, okay? And not simply how are we gonna achieve better results? Because I think that a preoccupation with results, in the case of test scores, risk the problems that Coretz has described that are mentioned in the report. But kind of, it seems to me that in lots of other spheres of, of life in this city and elsewhere, how you get the results matters a great deal. So that, for example, if you want to kind of reduce crime, you can arrest every 16, 17, 18, and 19 year old boy on the streets of some neighborhoods after nine o'clock. And in fact, will reduce crime. You're doing a lot of other damage along the way. If you want to produce a lot of oil, okay, you can drig down deep below the ocean, all right? So the results, what the results are matter and how you get the results matter. And I think that kind of what we've kind of, kind of and there are certainly the problems that, that Merrill has described with the kind of, with the quality of the test, but, and I, I believe the state is doing remarkable work towards changing that, but I think it really kind of, the preoccupation with results and the explicit saying is we don't care how you get there so long as you get there, okay, is a really, really bad approach to a kind of forging, you know, kind of really <laughs> ethical practice, okay? Cher Cheryl Tyler, I guess, one of the principals that Ramon knows, is quoting the report as saying that it's unethical to give an hour a day of test prep. I don't know if she's right or wrong about that, but I do know that the question of ethics is a very important thing, okay? What we do in schools, okay, has to in part reflect what we think is right. Yeah. 
Jackie. Yes. <laughs> public school parent, three children. Are the oh, okay, one more thing. I'm the proud <laughs> brother of another public school teacher who's in the audience too, not just a daughter. Oh. Um, are, are the school report cards useful for you as a parent? Oh, that's interesting. I want to say something about parent and uh, principal and parent. All right, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just I find that. It, it, empowerment works as much as the principal works. If the principal was creative before, they'll find great ways to utilize and go even further. And I found uh, many schools that were dark and abysmal and horrible, and then a new principal came in and said, no, these kids, despite being low c income, despite being minority, despite the social s stresses, they deserve a better environment, a better uh, curriculum, and better technology. And they've put things in place and gone from being a C school to an A school, and it's because they really had an understanding of their community, their kids, their parents, and they gave the kids a reason why their education was important beyond just coming to school. They got them involved in giving to community, giving to other cultures, and they realized that the power they can use their education for beyond that. So it really does depend on the principal's vision and how well they were able to execute things before, and now they, they, they have a little bit more liberty. Even and, and if they don't have a vision? If they don't have a vision, you have the same problems that you, you had before. You, you have uh, the uh, partnerships and the networks, but you don't really know how to utilize them to the best ability. Um, in re regards to the report cards, I have three kids who are in Manhattan, one in the Bronx, and the Manhattan schools, both of them are A, and uh, the, the, the Bronx Middle School is a B school. But honestly, I didn't use uh, the report cards as uh, any indicator in terms of choosing my child's school. And that is even before the report cards existed. I feel that parents really need to know their child. And they, there are enough variations of schools in this city between selective, progressive, charter, that you can really know your child and choose the best school according to um, your child's needs and abilities. But I usually advise parents to choose, the, choose not to um, to take the report cards with a grain of salt and to really not um, go by that grade that they see there because if you notice from the charts, the letter grade is there in big, bold letters. And our generation actually grew up with report cards that had A, B, C, and D, and E, and F. And, uh, no, no E, just F. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and we are really uh, attuned to those letter grades and what they mean and oftentimes parents will pull up the progress report C and A and read no further and just decide based on that that they will put that school down on the, the high school choice list or on, on the middle school list and not really take the time to go through the details. So in that sense, it's really not very useful and maybe a little bit misleading for the average parent. Could I just add a point? Yeah, um, Shale, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so John mentioned something important, I think, which is that it's, important not to just focus on numbers alone. And I think that it's also important not to misrepresent what we're doing. And we have really carefully tried to balance both quantitative and qualitative measures in the system. So there's a quality review of every school. And the quality review um, looks at academic quality. It looks at questions of what's the rigor of the instructional practice in the classroom? Um, experienced leaders, mostly superintendents, go into schools and review the schools. They talk to parents. They visit seven or eight classrooms in the average school. These are reviews that last anywhere from two to three days. Um, we look for, is there instructional coherence? Is there a link between how the curriculum is set up, how the pedagogy works, how assessments are used, how teachers collaborate and work together. And those indicators on that quality review are really part of the message that we're sending to principals about what we think ac academic quality is in the school system. And it's part of what networks work on as they're supporting schools. And it's really important to be there wasn't a lot of detail in the report about what networks actually do, and I know there are a bunch of network leaders here in the audience. Um, network teams work intensively inside schools around providing instructional support, and a lot of that support is focused on 
exactly the kinds of issues that we've been talking about is important. How, how good is the pedagogy? Um, how do we make it more rigorous? How do we get teachers to learn more from each other? How do we surface effective practices across schools? The point of letting schools form networks that are non-geographic is not because there's a big opposition to geography, and many networks actually are mostly geographic. It's because we want principals to work together with people they can learn from and that they want to connect with. And so the kinds of experiences that Ramon was talking about in his network where principals are visiting and sharing with each other and learning from each other is, is exactly the purpose. Now, not all networks are as good as every other network, and it's about capacity, just like with principals. You need to build the capacity of principals. You need to build the capacity of network teams, and that's part of the work that we're continually doing. But that, that is a powerful set of instructional supports, and in order to do instructional support well, um, it's actually much more effective when you're not telling someone what to do, but you're actually creating an opportunity for people to learn and to, to share and to grow. You know, John. I just want to say, kind of the, kind of the quality review that's currently being used, that I, sh I assume that Cheryl had a great deal of response for, is a remarkable document. I urge you all to take a look at it and to really try to digest it. What's interesting is that it, it kind of, it came after a set of quality reviews that were not nearly quite as thoughtful or as sophisticated, where in fact they largely were kind of accessories to data use, okay? They were not kind of especially concerned with the kind of key issues that Cheryl just described. And I think one of the things that that highlights is, and we've all probably been guilty of this, is that the Department of Education is hardly a monolith, okay? There are, in fact, different points of view, different emphases, okay? And they kind of work themselves out inside the, in the context of a very, very large bureaucracy, in the context of a very politicized environment, okay? And so it, there's probably not all things are possible all of the time. And I think that kind of one very important thing would be to make the criteria in the school quality review explicit as a statement of this is what the department believes constitutes good, effective educational practice in the city of New York. And that would be a giant step forward. I have some questions from the audience now. Um, and I think this one's probably for, for Meryl Tisch, but maybe Shale. Why are New York state high school teachers grading their own students' state exams, watched over by their assistant principals and principals, of course, who have an incentive to raise numbers. Well, I, I want to say that this is an issue, uh, the time has come to have this conversation. We are deeply troubled by all of the audits that come back to us in different school districts about the grading of these exams, and we plan to have a very significant conversation about this going forward. Uh, you know, I believe that most people in the system, and it's not, it's not just me being a Pollyanna, I believe most people in the system are really people of integrity. I believe teachers and principals go to school every day, more or less, the majority of them, to really do a really good job and take their work very seriously. But like in any other large system, we need to acknowledge that there are opportunities to, shall I say, cheat the system. And we have to, we can't ignore that anymore. And I, I think we're going to be on that one. Another question, this one's probably for Shale. It seems that as long as principals produce the data for academic results, it gives them the right to abuses, management, and the handling of parents and students. At what time can a principal be held accountable for this management, when does the superintendent step in and say academic results aren't enough and we recommend re removal of a principal because scores and academic results can change? Um, it's a good question. Uh, so in my former role, before I worked in accountability, I was part of the Empowerment Schools organization and supervised 11 networks. And, and that work was very involved with helping to solve problems that would flare up in a school where either parents or students or other members of the community felt that there was an issue. And we worked actually very closely with the superintendents for those districts. And now under the structure, there's actually an error on the chart that you presented. Superintendents and networks are part of the same organization now. They're part of the Division of School Support and Instruction. And they do work increasingly closely together to try and respond to issues and there are dozens, in a system this large, there are dozens of issues that come up. 
and there are sometimes principals that make mistakes or act inappropriately, and those are taken very seriously, and a lot of time and effort is made to try and solve those problems. So in my role, I, when a network and the superintendent were stuck and they couldn't solve it, I often got involved and would meet with parents, meet with members of the community, the CEC, um, to try and work through those issues. And I think there's a real commitment on the part of the department um, to try and be responsive to those kinds of concerns. Now, we don't always get to the point where everyone is happy with the outcome, but we do really work hard to make sure that everyone is clear on why we made the decision we made. And when a parent is right about an abuse that's happened, we often do take very forceful action, and principals have been removed in cases where there's inappropriate. Uh, Jackie, I want you to follow up on that. Um, at, as um, a member of the Community Education Council for District 10 in the Bronx, do you find that uh, parents' concerns are addressed adequately, or? What happens in the Bronx is uh, most of our parents respond uh, reactively to situations. So whereas the report uh, discusses the fact that there are those who may email the chancellor or email at Nailstern, our parents really don't have a, a front line, a first line of defense to go to. And they really don't have the um, belief system in the CECs um, to be effective uh, in terms of taking it higher and having that influence to make the change that or to, to get the information that they're looking for. And so uh, there is a uh, definite, definite need to put some power back on that front line because uh, these are not parents that have the savvy or even the time to come to events like this and find out the information, the context that they need in order to get you know, decisions made and move on. Um, John, oh yeah, Ramon, sure. From a uh, principal's perspective, um, there's like a new big brother out there. It's called 311. And a lot of parents <laughs> have been using it. Um, and I think it's been a, a way to document issues that aren't addressed other ways. Um, and it's amazing that um, how quickly when those calls go in that uh, principals respond. Um, and um, I, I believe in social justice and I think parents have to take a role. Um, and when they can't find any other way, I think 311 solves a lot of problems because superintendents do call your school and want to know how to close out this case, what's the problem, how are you going to resolve it. And some principals who may not have wanted to meet with that parent, now will meet with that parent. So I mean, it's an avenue that I don't think is discussed much, um, but it's something that I see creep into a lot of schools um, because I get from my colleagues questions about, did you even do a one call? And that seems to be the new thing. I don't know if that was meant to be used that way, but in terms of, of parent savvy, they're finding and that's an effective way to get things done. John, you want to jump in? No, I'll hold off on the parent one. Uh, next question. Um, regarding the New York City graduation rates, how has the student discharge rate changed from 2003 to the present? And what has been an increase in the percentage of incoming CUNY students requiring remediation since 2003. So, John, can you answer the, the kind of, CUNY part of that? The data at CUNY, I think, is a little bit mixed, okay? The kind of, certainly the number of young people, who, because the number of graduates is growing from the public schools, therefore the number of entrants into CUNY is growing as well. And I believe there's been some significant growth in the number of entrants who qualify for admission to a baccalaureate program because they don't need remediation. On the other hand, for students who, who wind up going to one of the community college or associate degree programs, okay, it's been somewhat of a bit of a roller coaster. In some years, the, the rates of remediation have gone down a bit. I think the last time they looked at it, it gone back up a little bit. Uh, kind of, I think that, I mean, uh, the, the, the chancellor has already spoken to, about this issue, okay? We have a very big problem that is certainly not the fault of the New York City Department of Education, that graduation standards are effectively not aligned in any meaningful way with college readiness standards, okay? So the kind of, even the fact that the kind of, the, re, the sort of the extent of remediation, I think, is a somewhat ambiguous and, and kind of and vague indicator of the quality of the schools. I think that, I know in fact, okay, that the department has been working very, very closely with CUNY, okay, to take very seriously the question alongside the kind of the introduction of new state assessments to really make college readiness the standard for high school graduation. Uh, so. um, Shale, can you answer in 25 words or less the discharge question? I, I don't have the data here, but you know, there has been a close look on the grad rates and I think that they're, they're very solid. I think that 
one of the things that is important just in response to John's point, we have a, in the past year really for the first time developed a strong partnership with CUNY exactly on this question of how do we align our standards with the standards um, that CUNY needs kids coming into in order for, to reduce that remediation rate. A question for Merrill Tisch. If these tests are not acceptable measures of schools or principal's performance, how are they acceptable measures for teacher performance? Well, that, you know, that's a, that's, let me, let me say that the, both Commissioner Steiner and I have spoken out very forcefully on this subject. We could have gone like other states, Tennessee, Delaware, Colorado, and said 50% is going to be based on state test scores. I think what we did was we took a look at it and we said 25% of teacher evaluation is going to be based on state assessments. The rest of that 40 points that's going to be tied to student performance will be locally negotiated. I know Terra Nova, the city uses a variety of different test forms. We would not say, quite honestly, that 40% of teacher evaluation should be based on the state tests as they exist today. Having said that, I think I, I really need to emphasize this. Yes, the tests are not perfect, but we believe that even in an imperfect form, they do give us valuable information about what's going on with students and what's going on in classrooms. We believe going forward, as the assessments improve, become less predictable, wider tests wider bands, change into the next generation of testing, that you will see that 25% number go up along with the quality of the tests. So, you know, I, I mean, um, I think we are in a very comfortable place. I think we haven't promised too much on what these tests can deliver, but I think we are clear in saying that they are not invaluable and uh, it's just how you use them, which I think is the heart of the question today. Um, here's a, a question. Um, classroom teachers are cynical about the reorganizations. Um, can you improve pedagogic practice without buy-in from the teachers? Who wants to take that one? I, I'd like to. Um, <laughs> so another part of the work of the accountability office has been to work with networks to work with principals on building inquiry teams in every school. And over the past year, um, we've gotten to the point where two thirds of all teachers in the system are part of teacher teams. And what these teams do is they meet together regularly, they look at student work and student data, they look at the teacher assignments and the curriculum that produced that work and they make adjustments to their practice with their colleagues to try and improve the outcomes of the kids that they're working with. And that process, that cycle of looking at what kids are able to do and then thinking about the practice and how it can be improved is a very empowering thing for teachers. And I think that the intent behind teacher teams is to create opportunities for teachers to learn from each other and accelerate their own growth also think about who is leading those teams. The people who are leading those teams are other teachers. And it creates opportunities for teacher leadership within schools to develop. And that's also very important. And the kinds of ideas that come out of those teams often impact decisions that principals and the school's leadership are making. And so we've really invested a lot of time and effort in that strategy because we believe deeply that teachers need to be empowered also, and teachers need to have a role in shaping the instructional direct direction of the school. At that point, I'm going to wrap it up, um, and thank you all for coming to see our presentation on managing schools. Can't wait to get out of that light. <laughs> oh. <laughs>